Hi, I'd like to talk to you today about buying a used server. I made some other videos in the past where I've explained how to install things like VMware or Windows and all that, and I'm getting a lot of questions. People, I guess, are getting uh, used servers. They get them online, eBay, wherever they're getting them from, and they're finding that once they get the box, they take it out, and they're not too sure what how to get started or what they're looking at. Um, so, first off, a server is really just a big PC. I mean, putting it bluntly here, but the whole point is to get more cores, more memory, more disk space. So the first thing to do when you take it all out, of course, make sure that you get what you ordered. And by that, what I mean is make sure you've got the power supplies, you've got your processors, you've got your memory. Potentially, you don't have any drives on it. Of course, that should be your choice. When you purchase it, either it comes with all that equipment or you're gonna to have to assemble it yourself. Not to worry, um, a lot of these things are well documented in the sense that if you're getting a Dell server or an HP server, there are parts that go with it. You could easily look it up, see what the part numbers are, and you're probably gonna end up looking for things uh, like caddies for the drives. And we're gonna go through all that and I'm gonna show you roughly what I do when I get it out of the box. So I got a brand new, this is an R730, and by, by new I mean it's, new for me and I just got it out of the box. And uh, so this is a used server. And the first thing you probably wanna do is inspect it. And the way you do that, right off the bat, first thing I usually look at is to see what kind of condition it's in, is go ahead and open it up. And first thing I take out is one of the fans. And a lot of these, I mean, if you get a, for example, a 640 or a 630, you, the fans are gonna be smaller. Uh, but the point is you can take a look at what it looks like. Is there a lot of dust in there, a lot of debris? Uh, if there is, then you know that uh, it's not been cleaned, first of all. And um, so it's all gonna sort of give you a hint as to what you need to do from the get-go. If it is dirty, if you're opening it up and there's an inch of you know, dust and whatnot in there, then you need to take it pretty much apart, make sure that everything is cleaned. If you've got processors built in, maybe remove the thermal paste that's there and put in, apply some new thermal paste. That's uh, usually a good first start. Okay, so let's assume that the inside look appropriate, relatively clean. At that point, you can move forward and start looking at what you really need to get this to run. Now, if you like this video, give us a thumbs up and of course, subscribe. That really helps us out and we do appreciate it. So let's take a look at where we get started. Well, first of all, make sure that when you purchased it, that you also got the power cables. If you don't have any of those, you can really find power cables that came with PCs. Those should work adequately with most servers. Of course, I'm assuming that you got the type of power supplies that will plug directly into uh, the normal power in your home or small office, and you're not getting like a, you know, a 20 amperage, uh, 20 ampere rather, uh, plug or anything special. With that out of the way, what do you look at? Okay, so one of the things that I do is when I purchase one of these, like if it's a Dell, for example, I make sure that I get iDRAC Enterprise. You might also just get Express. That will help us out in setting it up. It's a lot easier, especially if you've got multiple of these and you want to put them in a rack. That might save your uh, proverbial, uh, let's just say life, as opposed to the B word, um, in times of crisis. If you're remote and you have these things somewhere on a rack and you need to reboot or shut down for some kind of catastrophe or power went out for too long, the UPS didn't quite work as expected, uh, uninterruptible power supply, in case you're wondering what that is, uh, then that provides you basically with a card that is in effect a small PC within the server, and it not only allows you to power it on remotely, you can also, with the right software, uh, go and see what's actually on the console, meaning that I don't need to plug in a screen, a keyboard, and a mouse, I can remotely get into it and type as if I was plugged directly to the unit. Okay, so the ma major factors, of course, are making sure that the processor and the memory are properly seated or in the unit. Once you have that, I would say most of your configuration um, anxiety goes down because at that point, in theory, you've got a machine that at least turns on. Now, we spoke briefly about drives. Now, I have multiple videos about different types of drives. Now, depending on what you have, if you have, uh, for example, in this one right now, I've got some three and a half drives. These are 10 terabytes. So we basically put those in and they simply slide into the unit. If you've got smaller units, 
what you want to do is you want to take one of these caddies or trays and they usually come with the screws and if you need something for a two and a half because now you'll say hey wait a minute I've got one of these but how do I get this to fit well you'll see in a moment that clearly there's a problem and what you do is you now need to make sure that you have an adapter. And what the adapter looks like is really just type of an L-shaped here that will simply go in here. And of course it does come with the screws as well. And you basically put it in here and put that into the drive. So this fits in there, this fits in there. And at that moment, you've got yourself, actually it goes in this, direction and basically it would fit in there you just simply need to screw it in properly and make sure that it aligns which I did not quite get so anyway you get the idea and at the end you are left with a drive that looks something like this you'll also find that if you get the manufacturer's drives sometimes what they'll do is they'll actually have uh, the drive pushed off a little bit and they'll have a piece of electronic on top. They've got a small circuit board and that also uh, could be for, there's different types of drives. There's S, uh, there's uh, SATA, there's SAS. So depending what kind of drive you have, um, might change things slightly. Uh, most, I guess if you're doing this with a used server, most of you are gonna wanna go with SATA drives. Now I do have other videos on this, but I will repeat it. When you get these, uh, I would certainly suggest that you go with an enterprise or a NAS, NAS grade drive. The reason being is these are really made to work together. So if you're going to do a RAID 1, as an example, where you've got two disks running, and basically what the computer will do or the server will do is it'll write and read to both at the same time. The idea is that you get a copy on both. Should one of them fail, the other one still has the data. You don't lose data. So. Uh, these are made for that. If you, if you get consumer grade SSDs or drives, uh, you'll end up with strange things. You're going to discover words like um, raid punctures and uh, <laughs> you don't want to know about those, trust me. The idea is that it, it, does, it is built to react better or to handle certain types of reads and writes and certain types of um, you know, little quirks that you can get when you have more than one of these combined in a RAID. So use those, and of course they traditionally have more endurance as well. So if you get a, in, a very inexpensive SSD, for example, longevity of it may be so small or so short that they, they will wear out prematurely, causing you other problems. The last thing you wanna do is create one of these, um, put it into a production environment, perhaps it's a test server at first, Lo and behold, if you're uh, like most companies out there, I think I can probably get a lot of stories out of you, but I've seen it a lot. The test server all of a sudden gets put into production. It's temporary. People don't say, ah, don't worry about it. It's just, uh, you know, we need to run this. We need to run that. And next thing you know, uh, two, three years down the road, it fails and you say, why is this server in production? Why is it running this critical component of the ERP or whatever it happens to be? Uh, I see it all the time and it's involuntary and a bunch of logical steps as to where, where and or how it got there and so forth, but uh, besides the point. So with all this, the main point is when you get the server, now people ask me, okay, how do I know how to get into it? What do I do? I mean, obviously you can simply plug in a keyboard and a mouse. Uh, there's USB keys, uh, ports rather, in the front, there's USB ports in the back. Uh, you plug it into it. There's a VGA, and of course depends on the brand and the model, but most of these servers have VGA. Uh, some have the back, some have both the back and the front. Anyway, there's a combination. Uh, this one here has both the front and the back for a VGA. So you can go and plug in a screen, plug in a keyboard and a mouse. And at that point you can get into the BIOS. These have uh, life cycle. Um, so basically when you start it, you can, you've got a bunch of options. You can go right into it. The other thing that you can use if your server has an, uh, an LCD in the front is you can scroll through it. So for example, it could give you the IP address of the iDRAC, that's one of the options. So if you have iDRAC in the back, you would simply plug in the wire, so it's a network cable at the back, and the iDRAC in the case of uh, Dells are completely 
on the extremity and on this model specifically, but uh, some of the others, is, I believe, as well. And so you plug it in, and if you're lucky, right off the bat, it will get you a DHCP address, meaning it's going to be on your network. It will get an automatic address, and then you can find it. I like things like Advanced IP Scanner, for example, which will scan your environment and will actually show me what the IDRAC IP address is. That's one way to do it. Of course, like I said, you can go to the LCD display in front of it, go and it'll give you the IP address. Should you get an IP address that is not the same as your network? For example, if it gives me 192.168.100.1 and my internal is 10 dot something, well, I'm not gonna be able to connect to it easily. So at that point, what I would do is take a laptop manually, so put a static IP address on the laptop that is basically uh, you know, similar to what I have on the server, so 192.168.100.2, and then I can communicate with the server and go connect to it using a browser. So that's one quick, uh, you know, fast way of doing it. And the idea is that once you get into the iDRAC, then you can go and check the configuration. If you've got multiple drives, you can go ahead and set up your RAID, and it'll really help you out to get things started and get this set up. Uh, if you're going to go down this path, I strongly urge you, since you're setting it up, to make sure that you've got the latest firmware. So go into uh, the lifecycle option on there and just, um, yeah, go and check, put it off on the internet, make sure you get all the latest drivers, the BIOS, uh, all those things set up right from the get-go. You know, just in case there's anything, especially if you're installing things like VMware, the latest version, and sometimes there are known issues with BIOS revisions and certain drivers or certain firmwares for, you know, RAID cards, whatever it is, it will just, you know, potentially take off a problem that you could have and get it resolved right from the get-go. So let's take a quick look. I'm gonna go ahead and just show you um, basically the front of this unit to show you how the, the drives get put in. Uh, and of course, what's really nice about these units is you can use different sizes. So for example, I can have, in this one I've got two 10 terabyte drives, for example. Uh, right now I've got a 1.9 terabyte uh, SSD drive, so I can put that, that in there. Obviously, if you're going to be doing a RAID 1, you need two drives that are the same. So in this case, you get two identical drives, and they don't have to be side by side. I mean, you could select what you want, so when you put them in the bays, you know, it doesn't have to be one next to each other, one on top or one beside, none of that. But obviously, from a, a human point of view, usually you do want to visually see them grouped together so it does make it easier, especially if you're dealing with uh, these units where you have all 2.5 inch drives and you've got a whole stack of them. Uh, it can become awkward, especially if you have multiple servers. If you've got the first drive and the 11th drive and then the other server, it's the second and the 14th and you're going to go crazy at some point trying to um, figure out what RAID goes with what. I mean, it's, it's not the end of the world. You can certainly go look it up and whatnot. But I'm just saying, usually what I like to do is uh, not only set it up, but also maybe put a little sticker and say, hey, drive zero and one are RAID one. They're being used for the OS and you know, makes it a little easier when you've got quantity. If you've got a single server, you've got two drives, four drives, probably not going to be a big deal whatsoever. So here's the business end of this particular server. As I've mentioned, basically what you've got are the three and a halfs here. If you wanted to put two and a halfs, then it would look something like this. And all you need to do at that point is to put them in and just simply slide them in. Of course, you want to open this, you slide them in, and then you push, and same thing with this. So now I've got two drives. I've got third drive, and of course, when I want to put the next one, I would do so. Now, what I was talking about the LED earlier, here we go. So what you want to do is you want to go, for example, to view, click view, and it says, okay, I want to see the IDRAC IP. See, this is where you get to change it. You could say history. So I want the, so then you, of course, you can go into setup, and you could set this up and you could say, hey, I want a DHCP in, or a static IP address. So I'm going to leave it to DHCP, but I just wanted to show you roughly what that looks like. So if I wanted to view, so now I want to view what's on, what's set up on this IP4. 
There we go. So now that shows me that the IP address that I need to go and connect is this one here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go on my computer and we're actually going to go and connect to the iDRAC and then we can set up. I'm going to add another drive and we're going to be able to set this up. Now, before I do that, let's take a quick look at the back of this unit. Okay. So in the back, a few things that you're going to have to do is make sure that you have power to all your drives. So we're going to put that in. So now you've got two power supplies. And of course you want to make sure when you get these that your power supply has enough wattage. So this is a rather large one. These are uh, 1,100 or 1,100 watts. You also can find uh, 750s and lower. So the obviously the, the larger the better, especially if you're going to be adding a GPU or anything like we have in this particular unit. Uh, next, this is a daughter card here. So when you purchase these, you'll get specifically uh, what you ordered. So if you want 10G um, base T, for example, you want fiber. Uh, this one is just gigabit ethernet. And what we have here in the back is my VGA for my screen. I've got a keyboard and mouse that connect through a single one. And here is the iDRAC. And it actually is written, if you look right in back there, I'll push that out of the way. But if I push, it does say iDRAC right here. So this is what I connect. And by the way, one of the questions I do get a lot is this light here. And what that will do is it actually puts a, a little light on in the front so you can identify it on a rack. All right, some of the other things to consider as well, when you get a server, make sure to think about potentially if you need rails. So if this is going into a rack, you're going to need some rails. And the other thing too is you may have a bezel in front. What's a bezel, you may ask? That is actually one of these. So this will be for a tower. And of course they change depending on the model and the brand. But uh, some of these uh, for Dell, this is, these are for, uh, I think this is a T6, uh, T4. 4640 or so and uh, in this case this R730 comes with a bezel that looks like this so you simply uh, it goes basically to the front and it protects the uh, drive bays and of course it allows you to lock them so in the case of a rack environment you have the ability to lock them with a key and the key is actually on the inside here of the bezel and so you'd simply lock it up so no one can take your drives or change your drives without your permission. So that's an additional little bit. So we're gonna have another video uh, to specifically show you what we look at when you get a new computer uh, like this. If it's used, you may not know what the password is for the iDRAC. I just showed you briefly how to get the IP address so that you can go and connect to it. So once you've connected to it, what do you do? How do you reset that? I'll show you that in a separate video. So I'm Bob Pellow and CTO Bob. I hope you enjoy this video. Leave us some comments below. We really enjoy reading those. And of course, check out the rest of our videos. We do show how to install uh, VMware uh, ESX i7, uh, 6.7, etc. There's a few versions out there in our videos, how to install it from scratch. So it'll make it easy. Just follow along step by step. So hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.